Hi, I'm Oriol Serbia, driver of the number 16 in the car, and you're watching Playing the Field. Hello and thanks for joining us. I'm Maria Soraya. We are on the road with our Los Angeles Angels right here at Yankee Stadium. Now it's been a very busy road trip for our Angels, starting with Albert Pujols, who hit number 500. That's right, 500 career home runs. Now, we were hoping he would do it right here for us at Yankee Stadium, but he did it in Washington, D.C. Last night I had a chance to catch up with a slugger who talks about hitting 501 and the milestone. I'm feeling good. I mean, it's, it feels good to feel uh, healthy, you know, which it hasn't been the last couple of years. But uh, it's still a long season, you know, as long as I can contribute any way I can out there with my glove or either at the play. Uh, at the end, that's what it's all about. Your teammates followed through with you tonight as helping as well. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I think we're having a, a great road trip. We're seeing the bat pretty well in Detroit. I mean, we could have easily won that series in Washington. We won the series, a uh, tough loss, you know, on Wednesday. But we bounced back today, obviously, against the guys that always been tough against us. And we uh, scored some wrong early and see you throw a great game. And a big congratulations to Albert for hitting 500. And a little later in the month, the Angels are going to have a special bobblehead, so you won't want to miss that. All right, now the big story, of course, here at Yankee Stadium all year is the retirement of Derek Jeter. I had a chance to sit down with a Yankee captain who talked about his past, present, and future. Derek, <laughs> could you have ever imagined when he first started out that you'd be with one team that long? No, I was trying to make it through the first week, to be quite honest with you. I was afraid I was going to get sent down. So, no, it's, it's something that um, in this day and age in sports, I think in any sport, you really don't see it too much. It's very, very rare. Over the years, you've seen, you know, stadiums change, rosters change, managers change. What was the toughest one for you along the way? Ooh, uh, I think probably when some of the players leave that you're used to playing with for so long. You know, we've had a lot of successful teams. Um, we develop friendships and guys are like brothers and then when they decide it's time to go home or they get traded somewhere I think that's probably uh, the most difficult thing to deal with. I think a memory that we're all going to have forever is when Yankee Stadium changed and you took the mic and said you know it's going to be okay and we're going to flourish in the new stadium. Was that something you thought about or just happened? No you know I, I before it I, I knew I wanted to acknowledge the fans. Um, I got taken out of the game I think two outs in the ninth inning and then sat there and said, uh oh, I got to figure out something to say. So I just sort of did it off the cuff. And, and um, But I was aware of the fact that I wanted to acknowledge Yankee fans. You, you're, you have so many records, obviously, that we could sit here and talk about forever. Is there one that's more special to you than any other? Or? I just like to win. You know, that's it. I, it's, you know, you play this game for one reason, and that's to win championships. Uh, I learned that from our owner before he passed away. He, especially paid attention to detail and um, coming out here and having the opportunity to win every year. So uh, I mean, I'm most proud of those, those five World Series championships. Joe Torre once told me that you are the guy who sets an example and lives, lives by it. And I know that your charity is about that. Just talk about that. Yeah, it's a foundation I started called the Turn 2 Foundation after my first full season. And, uh, you know, it's for the prevention of drug and alcohol abuse for kids. And, you know, when I was younger, I looked up to Dave Winfield. He's one of the first athletes to have his own foundation. And, uh, I always thought if and when I made it, I wanted to do the same. Well, and that you absolutely did. When you think about over the years, was there ever a moment when you thought that maybe something was going to happen and you weren't going to be a Yankee? Was there ever a time uh, when you thought maybe? Of course. <laughs> you know, I came up in the era when if you didn't perform, they'd get rid of you. And, uh, you know, there are times in the minor leagues when I thought I would be traded. There are times in the major leagues you go through some struggles, you think you may be traded. So. It was never a comfortable feeling, and I think that was a good thing for us when we came up. Uh, you know, we, we went out there, we played hard. We knew we had to play hard. We knew we had to do our job. Otherwise, we'll find someone else to do it. I think you might stay here and maybe do something else, or maybe just try something altogether different. Uh, you know, I don't know. I would love to own a team, be an owner, and be able to call the shots. Um, other than that, I couldn't see myself coaching or managing at all because the travel gets kind of tough throughout the years. When you get ready, we'll hook you up with Magic Johnson. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> and when we come back, more baseball, some auto racing, and our Los Angeles Clippers are working their way through the playoffs. 
And the Los Angeles Clippers are taking on the Golden State Warriors in round one of the NBA playoffs. And our own Will Lupardis had a chance to sit down with an expert on the subject, our good friend Arash Markazi. We are here with ESPN beat writer for the Los Angeles Clippers and all-around good guy Arash Markazi. How are you doing, Arash? Good. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Now, I wanted to ask you, because you're one of the closest people to the Clippers. You you, you, you go to cities they go to a lot. Yeah. Uh, you're definitely here at every home game and practices. What do you think is the thing that has made them different? Some of the factors that have changed this team from last year to this year and made them really focus on a championship. Well, this is their third time in the playoffs. I remember the first time that they made the playoffs. It was sort of like a new thing for them. They hadn't made the playoffs before. The second year, you can see them kind of get that experience experience some more but um, this is sort of the time where it's like okay it's it's not okay just to make it to the first round or the second round they have championship aspirations on this team and really they've been talking about that since camp began in October yeah I don't think there's another team in the NBA that I've seen that's as vocal talking yeah. about like we're not happy with uh, individual scoring or any individual awards or even a first round victory like they want it's championship or bust with these yeah. guys do you think Doc Rivers plays a big role in their confidence there? Yeah, huge. I mean, when they when they hired him, I mean, he is a guy who's won a championship, comes with that championship experience. And I think that they kind of lacked that before. I think Del Negro was a good coach, but he's a coach who hadn't gone past his second round before. So with Doc, you know, what Doc also did was there was a confusion here. If it was Chris Paul's team, if it was Blake Griffin's team, this is Doc's team. He's not only the head coach, he's the GM of the team as well. Right. And another thing, like, Lob City has been kind of their identity, yeah. um, even before Doc. You know, dunking and De DeAndre and Blake have been dunking balls for, for a few years yeah. now. So that doesn't work so well in the playoffs. So does this team need to find a new identity and not just be the lob dunkers to win playoff series? Yeah, I mean, that's what Doc has really stressed is that, listen, the lob dunks are fine. And those are two points that he'll gladly take. But they have to be a defensive team. That's got to be the mindset. We are a defensive team. So they've been talking about that. And they have improved on that end. But for them to be a championship team, they have to be a defensive team consistently. And um, I've also been interested in the fact that to win a championship, you need uh, to, to win road games. You've yes. got to be out there and win road games. Now, tell our viewers a little bit something that um, we don't, none of us, few of us get to see, which yeah. is what, what's, what are these players like on the road as opposed to a home game? Are, is there a more re relaxation because they don't have as much to worry about in a way? Yeah, you know, I think Blake and Chris enjoy playing on the road. I mean, they have a great, they're great at home. But they feed off of sort of the um, hate that they get on the road, for lack of a better word. So I think those are two players in particular that really kind of feed off the fans on the road. So uh, when they go on the road during the playoffs, I know that Doc has talked to them about that. I mean, it's you know you've 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 seen it on during the season, but on the in the playoffs, I mean things get r r ramped up. We saw in Game One that Blake uh, here at home threw a cup of Gatorade or some water on a fan. <laughs> Is he going to be doing that kind of, like, he has the comfortability of the Staples Center here. Is he going to have the gall to do that in, in, in Oakland? You think? Yeah, no, I think that was a one-time thing. Hopefully it doesn't happen again. He says it was an accident. I've seen the replay. I have a hard time believing it was an accident. But uh, th that aside, I'm sure that they've talked to him about that. He's, he's actually matured a ton this season. Uh, but there are time periods where he reverts back to the old Blake, the Blake who will complain about officiating, complain about back calls, or throw a, uh, throw a cup at a fan. Is, is fo obviously, focus has improved with his development. Um, do you think Blake is a guy who can lead an NBA team to a title? Uh, pretty close to it. The good thing for Blake is he doesn't have to with this particular thing team. I think he's a top five player, but Chris Paul is the, is the top guy on this team. Now, Blake is perhaps a more talented player right now of the two, but Chris Paul is sort of the point guard. He's the guy who runs the team. So uh, the good thing about that, Blake can kind of do his own thing without having to be the guy. Right. And um, going back to the Warriors series that we're in right now, um, I think it's, it's, it's cool that we have seen the Clippers play some of their most intense and heated games of the regular season over the past two years with the Golden State Warriors. And here we are matched up in the first round with the Warriors. Is it good for this team to develop some sort of, you know, in-state rivalry, somebody they can focus on that they really want to be, you know, kind of like the Pistons and Bulls used yeah. to have? No, I think it's great. By the way, I think they wanted to play someone except for the Grizzlies. Now, it's not that they're afraid of the Grizzlies. I think they've, they've played them twice already in the playoffs. They wanted to play someone new. 
and they really actually do hate the Warriors. They don't want to say that publicly, but they just don't like them. And the reason that they don't like them, they're both two young teams who are trying to do the same thing. They are trying to unseat the Spurs and the Thunder. So whenever you have that kind of situation, two competitors close in age who kind of like rub each other the wrong way, it, it creates a really cool situation where they don't talk to each other off the court, they don't do chapel or anything of that kind of stuff. So I think it creates a really cool playoff series. Got two very different teams heading up to Oakland. Are you going to go up for the series? Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll be there. And I have heard the atmosphere for games up there for the playoffs it is unreal. So I've, I've been there for a game during the season, never for the playoffs, though. That's a team that is uh, kind of their fan base has remained intact for, for decades, but they haven't had a lot of playoff appearances. So, you know, their fans are going to – be dumping water on the Clippers. Exactly. And it's a little bit like the Clippers, too, in terms of the Warriors and the Clippers historically for the past 30 years or whatnot have not had great playoff success, have not had great success, period. So it's kind of cool what's happened here with these two teams, with a, with a young core, two great coaches. They're trying to be the team now. Now, as far as the rest of the NBA, um, we're just seeing how the first round develops right now, and uh, some of these lower seed teams are doing pretty well. Yeah. Here in uh, April, can you can you give us kind of a final four, maybe the two best in the East, two best in the West, what we're going to see? You know, the interesting thing is for, you know, for a while I've said the Heat and the Pacers for sure in the East. Uh, I don't know what's happening with the Pacers right now, so I'm a little bit uh, concerned what's happening there. Um, I'm going to stick with the Heat and Pacers, even though I, I'm not confident at all that the Pacers are going to do anything. Uh, the we West, have this recorded that you said Pacers. I so. know, my goodness. But um, as good as the Clippers have been, this season. I do think they get past the first round. I don't see them getting past the th Thunder, uh, so I think it'll be Thunder plus the Spurs in the West. And I got OKC not only getting out of the West, but I got the OKC as the champions in the league. I think Kevin Durant has kind of been like, this is my year to win the MVP, this is my, my year to like claim that my throne as like the guy. Um, I, I think last year was a little bit tough for them with the injuries, but I think this is the year that they kind of like showcase them th themselves. Is this a Laker fan making these predictions a little bit, or is no, this? No, no. I mean, I, I, I listen. I, I go where the Clippers go. So if the Clippers can go to the NBA Finals and I'm in South Beach, I would love that. I, I hope they do. That'd be great. You'd enjoy Indianapolis just as much, right? Oh, for sure. I love Indianapolis. <laughs> well, Raj, thanks for sitting down with us. And if you're following the Clippers and you're not following this guy on Twitter, you need to follow Raj Markazi. You'll get some of the best news and uh, some of the best restaurants on the road too. Thanks, Raj. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Now, it's time to get to know two new faces on the Angels and the Dodgers. I sat down with Raul Abanez from the Angels and Drew Butera from the Dodgers. You know, Raul, you've been a guy who has helped many teams, and you're still playing at a very high level, even being a little bit older. How have you been able to take care of yourself to do that? A lot older. but <laughs> You um, know, just a little older. <laughs> um, but you know what? I think it's a combination of things. I think it's a combination of... Um, of diet and uh you know of of training strength and conditioning and taking care of yourself you know over the years and, and over the long haul and always keeping in mind that um <clears throat> you know longevity is not something that you think about when you're 35 you got to be concerned and focus with it you know before you turn 30 in my opinion and, and you take care of things and you don't think about 35 or 40 uh when you're 33 or 34 you got to take care of yourself the whole time so i've been fortunate and i've been blessed and uh and uh you know I, I try to eat the right way and eat the right things, and and, uh, and that really helps with my soreness and, and uh, you know, the strength conditioning component's huge, too. What about hitting? I mean, you, you, you hit at a very high level as well. I recently asked Torrey Hunter that question, and he said, you know, some guys can continue to sort of keep up their 25, 30, 35 home runs a year, and you've been one of those guys that have been able to do that. Yeah, the thing is that um, I think it's understanding, uh, you know, the evolution of your swing and understanding who you are and where you are. Um, and understanding the things that you do well and, and staying within those things, within that realm of, of the things that you do well. Um, and there's things that I don't do as well um, as I did when I was 32 or 33, but there are some things that I do a little bit better. So focusing on the things you do better and, uh, and, and trying to build off of that. 
You play on the East Coast and the West Coast. Why did you choose to stay on the West Coast and play with the Angels? Um, I think it's a great team. I think it's a great opportunity. Anaheim's always been my favorite city, uh, road city, and, and now living there, you know, spending the time there is just phenomenal. And, and also, you know, my family's on the West Coast. We live in Seattle, um, and, and you know, being in the closer proximity to my family and my children uh, makes it for nice, uh, you know, smaller trips that they can come out, uh, you know, while they're in school. And then, of course, in the summer, they're right there, uh, so they'll stay with me the rest of the time. So you'll be taking a lot of trips to Disneyland. No doubt. No doubt. We're going to be using uh, a lot of Disneyland passes. I'm going to see if I get a, a season pass to it. <laughs> Probably be a very good idea. They say you're, that, that you are the second nicest player, maybe the first nicest. We'll have to talk to Jim Tomey about that. I think Jim Tomey's probably nicer, and he's hit a lot more home runs, so he deserves it for sure. Well, thanks for spending some time with us. We appreciate it. You're not, you're not a new face to baseball, but a new face to the Angels. Thank you. Thank you. What's it been like so far being up at Dodger Stadium? Well, it's a great experience. You know, the, the history of the stadium and, and the fans are just electric every night. It's, uh, it's a fun place to play. You know, spring training went very well for you, and it's interesting because you guys have time to bond there, but is that enough time, or is it different once you get up here? Uh, I think it is enough time. You know, spring training is, is, is somewhat long, but, yeah. um, you know, what the, the season brings a different type of bond, um, you know, Spring training is is getting to know each other, getting to see what each other likes and what we don't like, and then when the season comes, it's a it's a grind and you know it's a battle together, and I think that unites us a little differently than spring training. You know, for people that don't know, you played in the World Baseball Classic for Italy. What was that experience like? It was a really really fun experience. The the passion that uh, each country had for um, their nation and for the game of baseball was really cool to see and to, to be a part of that was a fun experience. I wish we could do it more often. Yeah, I talked to Nick Punto about it because he was on that team too and he said it was just so cool because you know, as being Italian or Irish, whatever your nationality is, you you, you feel it like you're all related, kind of. Yeah, and that's that's the type of team that we had. We, we connected instantly. Um, and it was like we've been playing with each other for you know years upon years. So it was a, it was a good experience um, and I look forward to the next one. Yeah, well, I, like you said, it's too bad it doesn't happen a little bit more often. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, anytime you could bring uh, the world into a game and unite against each other and, and to battle each other is a lot of fun. Where is your family from in Italy? Uh, well, my grandfather's side is from Pisa, and my no, excuse me, my grandmother's side is from Pisa, and my grandfather's from uh, Palermo, Sicily. Mine from Sicily and Calabria. So, okay. yeah, interesting. Now, your dad played baseball as well. What was that like growing up with? A dad who played baseball. It was fun, you know. I got to be around the clubhouse, you know, the whole time. Even when he, you know, coached after he was done playing, I got to experience what a big league clubhouse was like, and and it really, that's what made me fall in love with the game is, is being around big leaguers and and seeing how much fun they had playing the game that I like so much. Did it seem normal to you growing up then, or? It did, yeah. I, you know, I'd go to school and be like, oh, what team does your dad play for? You know. <laughs> When I see Mark McGuire's sons out here and stuff, I'm like, they probably just think this is normal, like everybody's dad does this. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was, I was talking to A.J. Ellis about it, too, and his yeah. son, or his daughter was saying the same thing, but, you know, like, you know, what team does your dad play yeah. for? And that was the same way I was when I was a kid. I, you know, I was like, oh, my dad plays for the Blue Jays. What team does your dad play? You know, that type of thing. But um, the older I got, the the really more special I got to, you know, see how uh, it was and to, to really, really experience and to know what, you know, he did for a living and how unique and... Um, not that common it is. Now our baseball team at Peninsula High are doing very well. In fact, they're looking to go pretty deep into the playoffs. Caitlin Semko had a chance to sit down with the guys and find out who their favorite pro players and pro teams are. What's your favorite pro team? Uh, the Angels. And your favorite player? Uh, Jared Weaver for the Angels. Uh, the New York Yankees. And do you have a favorite player? Uh, Derek Jeter. My favorite pro team's got to be either the Rangers or the Nationals. Do you have a favorite player? Uh, not really. I'm just a fan of good baseball. Uh, the Angels. Do you have a favorite player? Mike Trout, definitely. Uh, the Angels, of course. Do you have a favorite player? Yeah, Mike Trout is my, uh, he's my guy. The Dodgers. And player? Puig. I'm a Yankee fan of favorite player is Derek Jeter. Uh, I just grew up, I started watching baseball and Derek Jeter was the guy because I just liked him. He was a leader, so I just try to follow after his footsteps. Favorite pro team, definitely the Angels. I've been a lifelong fan. And favorite player? Mike Trout, no doubt. And do you have a favorite pro team? The Yankees. Player? Derek Jeter. Great role model. Uh, the Yankees. Why the Yankees? Because I'm, I've been watching them for so long, and I just got to stick with my team. And do you have a favorite player? Definitely Derek Jeter. Probably the Angels. 
And favorite player? Mike Trout. The Dodgers. Definitely. And player? Uh, Clayton Kershaw. Yeah, Los Angeles Dodgers. Got to go with the home team. <laughs> and a favorite player? Uh, Clayton Kershaw. The Dodgers. Player? Hanley Ramirez. Thanks, guys, and we'll see you in the playoffs. And finally, the Indy 500 is just around the corner, and I sat down with some of the drivers who told me what it takes to get ready for the biggest race of the season. Yeah, you bring up a good point. It's the one race in the world that, you know, uh, we prepare more for, not only at the shop, but we're there for like three weeks, running almost every day, two weeks now. And, um, you know, you would think you have lots of time, but time runs away, you know, because you have so many things to test. You have so many different conditions, full tanks, full downforce, low downforce, different weather. Um, it's always interesting because we always, it's always Memorial Day weekend as the end of May. So it's kind of like season changing. You start there mid-May that it's every day, it's cold, almost rainy. And on race day, I mean, you guys that have been there, you know, it's super hot. Like we were like in the hundreds a couple of years ago, you know. So, the, you know, you've been testing there for two weeks and all of a sudden it's a lot warmer. And, and these cars get very affected by temperature because right. of, the, of the wings we have. Uh, we create downforce through the wings and the downforce is created by the oxygen out there, the air. And, and when there is, it's hot, there's less pressure in the air and you have a lot less downforce. So the car loses like 20% of the grip all of a sudden. So you need to prepare for those things and that's why um, you never have enough labs around that place. Well, you know, it's always so interesting to me because you you can allow for a million things. There's always stuff you can't allow for at Indianapolis. Yeah, you're never prepared enough. I mean, and you see it like with teams that have won there multiple times and have hundreds of years of experience, let's say, if you put every car that they had ever racing there and they still get caught up right, by exactly. you know they they'll go at a race with way too much downforce and they're like like two years in actually 2011 I was with Newman Haas started front row was great halfway through the race I'm lapping Castro Neves who's won that thing three times and I'm lapping him you know and it ends with Penske who's won it 15 times so you know you, you can you know you can never uh, assume anything for granted at that place. You always have to be prepared almost like, like a rookie. You know, they say, uh, there's that book that says um, Zen mind, beginner's mind in a way, like the beginner's mind is always the mind you should have, exactly. even if you've done it a million times. Because when you're a rookie or a beginner, you're just really aware trying to learn things. If you think you know everything, you want, More. you know, preparing for the unknown. And in racing, there's always the unknown. Uh, coming at you. So, how much pressure do you feel knowing that you're already at this three-time winner level, getting to the next one? I don't feel pressure, to be honest. I feel um, I I've been to a very fortunate situation, and because I tasted the milk, and because I it was awesome, everything. So I want to do it again. Yeah. So it's not about pressure. I I just know how good it is. And come on, I mean, uh, everybody loves when it's it's awesome, a, a, a good feeling of winning and, and uh, achieving your goals. And uh, I feel more like that. Plus, I have an amazing team. You know, Team Penske is just uh, all about details, and hopefully um, we're eager to make that happen. When you have two weeks, when you're there a little over two weeks, you have a lot of other responsibilities. You're doing charity work, and, and you're doing a lot of support for IndyCar. Does that give you enough time to really focus in on all of it? You know... There is the bad thing and, and the good thing. The good thing is you start meeting and, and making people feel much better. Uh, yes, it's time consuming, but that's part of the job, you know I mean? For me, I love what I do. So those little details, it's actually, I, I, I tend to turn in a positive way, which when I go to a place, I'm like, we're gonna have a good time. And, and it always, most of the time, turn out to be that way. But um, uh, I feel that um, I still have a lot to accomplish and hopefully we're gonna make it happen. And that will do it for today's show. I'd stay longer, but I've got to go shopping. I'm in New York. I'm Maria Sorreo, and I'll see you back in L.A. real soon.